Jared Paschke is a 29-year-old adjunct professor, full-time professional staff member, and a self-taught musician with a student-first mentality. Jared earned a Master of Arts in Film Studies from Chapman's Dodge College of Film and Media Arts in 2017. During graduate school, Jared worked in story development for two-time studio president Allison Shermer, Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, two-time studio president Michael DeLuca, The Social Network, Academy Award-winning director Robert Zemeckis, Back to the Future, and at ICM Partners before transitioning to higher education. Jaron has recently taught classes on media and visual culture at the University of Redlands, where he graduated in 2015 with his bachelor's. He has also taught coursework for Chafee College's Broadcasting and Cinema Studies Department, making special contributions to it using open educational resources. In Jaron's current position at the University of California, Riverside, he co-coordinates one of the largest learning communities in Southern California. In this position, Jaron generates academic advising screencast content proposed towards improving the first year experience. He has spoken at the UCR Academic Advising Conference, created highly successful enrollment tutorials, and notes that screencast production is without a doubt the most rewarding team sport. So a lot of great things to talk about in this interview. Jaron, welcome to the podcast. Thank you both for having me. We're very pleased, and I mean, what a, a, an intriguing background. I uh, got a little bit of a, a taster just before we started recording, but Jaron, one of the things we always like to do, I suppose, is um, give our listeners the opportunity to get to know our guests a bit better, and so we talk about like the, the path into to higher education. I think with you, this is going to be really interesting. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you found your way into higher ed? Sure. Um, you know, it's it's funny. My first position, actually, I was a film, television and like video laboratory aide uh, at RCC, Riverside Community College over here. And um, concurrently, I was also a supplemental instructor for public speaking. And that was my first position in higher ed. So I was going to RCC's uh, film program at the time. And um, I would fix equipment. I would check in equipment, make sure it wasn't broken when the kids would go out on shoots. And then in a completely different setting, I was assigned to one of the classes that had one of the highest drop withdrawal and fail rates on campus. And I was paired with um, an instructor who uh, literally still writes all of my letters of recommendation to this day from, you know, back in the day. And she was fantastic. She is fantastic. She's a communications professor. And, um, I would go in there and I would hold, you know, peer review study sessions outside and uh, outside of class with my fellow SIs and mentor other SIs and do all of those things. And, uh, just kind of proceed forward, helping the students as such. I got to know faculty. I got to learn how to help students in a very kind of basic, uh, way, film equipment, go and work on shoots. And it was kind of the perfect, uh, intro to higher education, um, community college environment, which was just a ton of fun just because it's so different um, and so diverse, which I really enjoyed. And then, um, you know, I actually continued working as a supplemental instructor uh, when I transferred. So I was able to do that, but my hours uh, deducted. And so I transferred over to University of Redlands um, into their media and visual culture program, visual media studies, and uh, continued as a supplemental instructor. And at some point I, uh, Graduated there and got a position um, with uh, Ali Shermer, uh, who, like, name a movie, and she's been attached to it. And I was uh, her story development intern, which was a great privilege. And so I had to quit being an SI, which was just awful because I loved working uh, for RCC. And um, RCC just it was fantastic. My mom worked there for 35 years. All my friends worked there. So it was a great, great community. It was kind of time to do something new. So I moved to um, moved moved to the film industry essentially, and it was completely different. So I don't know if you've all ever talked to anybody who worked in the film industry, or you know, I'm sure you've heard stories. But essentially, what I did is I drove 74 miles every day to and from Los Angeles. I'd leave my house at 3:30 in the morning um, while I was in graduate school at Chapman um, to go and work, and it would be like, here's a script, write coverage on it. Um, tell us what you think, if, if we can make money off of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I did that for just multiple people. I did that for when I transferred to Michael Luca's office, um, who was fantastic. I did that in uh, Bob's Mex's office. And I just kept doing that until more responsibilities were handed to me. Soon I was training the intern. Soon I was helping the executives with special projects. And eventually I got hired by um, 
ICM Partners, who represents just a slew of people, but namely I was hired by a Mo Picklet talent agent, motion picture literary talent agent. So Mo Picklet, they represent directors and screenwriters. So most notably, uh, the agent I was working for, um, she was voted one of Variety's like top 100 most powerful women. She was, you know, fantastic, very knowledgeable. And she represented Chris Morgan, who did all the Fast and the Furiouses, and Gary Doberman, who did the Conjuring series. He was a screenwriter. Um, but there was literally a day at ICM where I was like, this is not what I said I wanted to do in my personal statement. Um, I said I wanted to like teach and make an impact. Um, and I really just didn't enjoy it anymore. And when you're reading all these scripts and this isn't just, this isn't to say I wasn't good at what I did. I'm, I can sit here confidently and, you know, with my voice recorded and say I was pretty good, but I was just like, this is not who I am. And this doesn't align with the career trajectory that I see myself on. And it's funny because hearkening back to my first day in Allison's office, um, at this time I'd worked in multiple offices. Um, my, the VP of my company had told me there's easier ways to make money. It's harder to make it in the film industry than it is the NFL. He would tell us all these things. And I was like, man, this just does not seem like the way to achieve happiness. At least for me, I saw a lot of my friends uh, solicit a great deal of happiness uh, while in the film industry. And I actually had a great mentor and we had just a blast, but I figured, you know, maybe it was, I liked working for my mentor more than I was I actually liked working on movies, um, which is something that took a while to learn. Um, and I got out and there was a six month gap where I was like, Oh man, what am I going to do now? So I worked at Amazon and, um, then eventually, uh, Chafee picked me up. And I got to teach classes uh, for a long time in broadcasting and cinema studies. And I had a great mentor at Chafee, uh, Matt Morin, uh, who taught me about open educational resources. He taught me about programming. He let me kind of, um, you know, go to different satellite locations for dual enrollment on my own. And that was my first real experience uh, into um, formal professional teaching. What was great about that is I remember I had called my mom on the first day. I remember I got out of my first class and I was like, yeah, this is, this is it. You know, there was no doubt. Um, but there wasn't that same phone call when I got out, like out of my first day at Allison's office or anything like that. It was exciting, but I had taught my first class and I was like, I cannot believe people get paid to do this. This is the most amazing thing in the world. Um, and I felt that same way when I got my job at UCR, you know, it's instinctual. And it was instinctual to know that it probably wasn't right for me to be in the spot at ICM um, when someone probably wanted it more than me, you know. So uh, moving away from um, Chafee, I got this great opportunity to work with Jen, who you two have met now. And she's just fantastic and so knowledgeable about uh, student success programming. So under her tutelage, I got to just learn so much about uh, peer mentorship, student success, um, and most importantly, I think change efforts, how, how to initiate a change effort. Um, and when you're operating in a department and more broadly a, a campus, so that's really interesting and, and using data to kind of make all those decisions, which was a lot of fun. Um, so I have a wide variety of responsibilities kind of there, which we can talk about and kind of in between all that, I started doing some adjunct gigs, at university of Redlands, uh, where my, um, director, um, my boss at university of Redlands was actually my thesis advisor when I was ending the program. So, I mean, I've, I've been really fortunate to have people who, um, have mentored me and keep up those contacts. And, um, yeah, it's been a really great journey. Um, yeah, I've had a really great time. That's kind of how I got into it though. Yeah. And it's great that you're able to still keep these connections with a lot of these, these folks, a lot of these mentors. And we did talk with, um, someone who also graduated from Chapman and one of our previous guests who worked at Loyola Marymount university, who also was in the film industry. And so you got to share some of those stories too. And a lot, lot of great stories there. And I'm sure we'll be able to chat more about that at some point. Now, at UCR, what what would be your role right now, and like what exactly does that that entail? So, as the CNS Scholars um, Assistant Coordinator, um, right now, what I do is, in terms, it's it's like just a whole bunch of different things because learning communities, as I'm sure Jen told you, are like a different thing every day. But I think one of the 
the responsibilities I have are enrollment management, enrollment troubleshooting, uh, using student information systems to address a variety of audit issues. Um, on top of that, um, our student supervision, uh, building building in any way I can um, student success efforts that will narrow gaps and inefficiencies, uh, which include that are not limited to right screencasting. Bring like an interesting knowledge of technology where I can kind of deploy such efforts to maybe make it so the academic advising staff doesn't receive um, um, redundant emails, right? If we can deploy a certain um, screencast. Uh, likewise, learning management systems. I moderate a learning management system for uh, CNS scholars, uh, update it with information. Um, I aggregate all of the information there. Uh, I monitor the website, build the website, um, do all of those things. So it's funny because as I proceeded forward, while I help with the data, um, do all the enrollment management alongside Jen, um, you know, moder moderate and uh, help train all the peer mentors, peer advisors, peer academic leaders. I teach four first year seminars for the advising center in the fall. What I enjoy doing most, like Jen as well, is finding how we can get better, right? Finding how we can service our students better. Um, I mostly as well, like when it's hard and when I have to learn something new, and uh, that is also what she enjoys. So we really vibe culturally because it was just between two of us, right? It was me and Jen. Obviously, uh, we have bosses and so on and so forth, but um, we really enjoyed that kind of self-regulation of learning. Um, oh, we could do this. It was more like a then do it. Uh, my favorite director, for example, is Kevin Smith. Um, and I've loved Clerks. It's been my favorite movie forever, but I love the idea of Kevin Smith because we have this uh, parallel mentality, which he dropped out of Vancouver Film School and um, he just wanted to make a movie, so he made a movie. It's, you want to make a screencast, make a screencast. You want to make it potent, make it potent, right? Um, so I, I kind of uh, live by that philosophy. And uh, that's also how I got into the film industry, which is a little bit of a dangerous mentality. It's like, oh, you can, uh, you can make a movie. I can make a movie. And then now I'm in like a studio president's office because, you know, I've been a little ambitious here. Uh, so you know what the world's going to deal you. So it's pretty funny, but um, yeah, I'd say I have a wide array of responsibilities and assistance to the students. <sighs> There's 1,500 students, or you know, in our program at the start of fall, and that um, declines as we as we melt and students drop out of the program. But um, yeah, it's great. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, I I can hear the the desire for continuous improvement, and we definitely we heard that with Jen as well. I suppose for, for listeners, Darren, who aren't familiar with screencasts, um, can you just talk, talk to us a little bit more about that and about like how you feel, how you go about creating them and, and using them? Sure. So a screencast is a digital recording of one screen. Um, and there's a few reasons why a screencast is optimal, um, especially in an academic advising situation but more broadly in a flipped academic advising situation, which while Jen and I are not formal academic advisors and do not have like formal caseloads, you think we have a large population of students that typically come to us for their issues and we split them up by drop-in hours with 15-minute appointments. So in a flipped classroom, as I'm sure you both have been told, you know, and but uh, the individual space and the group space are flipped, right? So students' first contact with material, it happens outside of class. So you think the flipped advising situation, it's actually optimal for Jen and I because we are remote delivering them information such as a screencast, a digital recording of one screen, such as an enrollment in tor tutorial um, or how to accept the learning community block. Uh, how to register for classes, uh, things such as that. And then if they have questions about that, then they come in and they ask, right? Because by delivering and flipping those things that, uh, by flipping that organization, delivering those things outside of class, we now create time for more meaningful conversation with the academic advisor, the coordinator, right? And the conversation is no longer prescriptive or transactional, it's developmental. So a screencast though, in terms of, how you make it effective, it's a long process that is accompanied by a change effort within the office, right? You'll notice 
I think, well, I'll say this one, Lori Mestra, I think I'm saying that right. Um, she does a lot of work on library staff professionals. And one thing that she has noted is um, that a lot of professional staff uh, lack the kind of technical expertise to make not just a screencast, but a really potent screencast. Right. And I think that's a fair assessment to extend maybe to academic advisors. Feel free to disagree with me. That's fine. That's also been kind of my anecdotal experience, but I also, I'll toot my own horn. I, I'm pretty good at film production, you know, uh, surprise. That said, um, a screencast, it caters to kind of the learning preferences, format preferences, and communication preferences of our incoming freshmen, right? They're students, 95 to 2010. That doesn't mean it impacts their learning or their performance. That's an important distinction to make but it doesn't mean it's not possible to cater to them or create them. I can talk about the screencast production strategy, but also on top of that, I think what's important to note is that departmentally, it was a huge change effort to just convince people, you know, that this was a worthwhile cause. So, um, and I think this is, this is just important to note for anybody listening. Um, if you're going to enact, and I was a new employee, right? But if you're going to enact a change effort, it should be based on some sort of change effort model. And what I kind of found is, and this is like, I read a book recently, it was all about change efforts as well. And the first step in any change effort should be establishing urgency. Um, and the second step is building a guiding coalition. So this is Cotter's eight step uh, methodology. But I think that resonates with me particularly because I was receiving so many redundant emails and wasting so much time that could have been otherwise spent building resources for the learning community. And likewise, I noticed that same issue happening with my academic advisors who partner with me for the learning community. And I had the skills to kind of narrow this gap, free them up when I know that they already have these intense caseloads. And one thing I do know is that modern practitioners of academic advising use the resources to build and sustain relationships with their advisees. So I needed to build something and show them this would work. And it was probably going to start with just me. Right. And that's how I established my urgency. Um, then I could move on to a bigger, badder coalition. And this is kind of where it comes into the screencast production strategy. So I had nothing to begin with. Right. I was just like, oh, okay, I know how to screencast, which is what was I going to use? I was going to use quick time because that's just a couple of buttons. And I knew that filmmaking kind of comes into this three prong process, which is pre-production, production, production, and uh, post-production. Some people will tell you pre-production doesn't exist. It's where I go with, but uh, pre-production process, you have your script, you have your story development, your casting, uh, your collaboration with others and your script revision. And we were making, um, tutorials on processes such as how to accept the LC block, which is really important because that's what I was getting questions on how to do that all the time, which those of you listening um, in my process in the learning community, students accept all of their classes fall, winter, spring using a one button click, which shouldn't be that confusing, but you know, they have to go through a few different windows and um, click submit to accept all their classes. But they can't have, uh, you know, registered in other classes beforehand. And there's all these little things, you know, so there's a few ways to make that more potent. Um, and I'll talk about that. And then obviously there's production, which actually where you physically screencast it. Um, and then post-production, which is where the editing, the subtitles, the analytics, um, the graphics, all of that comes in. Um, but it's pretty, you know, it's pretty, pretty layered and pretty step-by-step, but, What's really important, my first step is having the student script out the process. This is the student's process and it's impacting them. So have them from their um, perspective script it out. And this to me is just like, you can kind of increase what Giles maybe would call uh, convergence between student to student if a student writes in their parlance uh, an enrollment tutorial, because it's going to be different when a staff member writes it, right? Now, a staff member should um, check it for accuracy. I think that's very true. And there should be verbal cues and markers in there that make it seem professional. But overall, it should be scripted by the student. Um, Casting, when you overlay the uh, narrative voiceover, it should be done by a student because I do not sound like a student. 
At least I do not think so. Um, and students can tell that, right? Other, more often than not, I think misinformation on a campus spreads, at least in regard to enrollment tutorials and things such as that, because students are like going to people other than their academic advisors. Um, so if you can create or simulate that environment in your screencast, that's really important. And um, from there, if an academic advisor or someone uh, reliable can check your script, you're ready to screencast, then after that, you can actually go ahead and uh, subtitle everything, um, do your analytics after you collect a certain amount of views, um, edit whatever need be. But it's, it's important to have the student's perspective, which is something I noticed that I struggled with is like, I couldn't find a way because our perspective when we go into our um, banner or whatever it is you use, it's like, I see my perspective, but they need to see theirs. So I literally just started using student profiles of my peer mentors, right? Uh, so I'm coming back to Kevin Smith here. I'm going to use Kevin Smith analogies all day. Kevin Smith said, um, I wanted to make a movie. Uh, I knew I had a cat, a turtle, and a convenience store. So I put all three of those things in my movie. I knew I wanted to make a screencast, and I knew I had peer mentors, right? So I knew that they were going to voice over my stuff. They were going to help me script it. They were going to do all this stuff. Uh, so I was collaborating with the students, the academic advisors, and Jen. And that's why I uh, say that this is a team sport. And uh, it's, it's a very cool process to watch it when it's successful. And following that, you distribute everything. So when's the best time to teach students how to register for classes? Orientation, right? So we started showing all of these things at orientation or uh, during the orientation period. So we send all these videos out. And uh, thousands and thousands of views started happening, and we stopped seeing those redundant emails. So it was fantastic. Oh, that's really cool. And you mentioned flipped advising. And so if you're listening right now, we did have an episode on flipped advising, which you can check out our December 7th, 2020 episode called Flipping the Script. So hit pause, check that out, come back, and then listen to more of this interview. Now, you mentioned you know having the student perspective, the student creating the script, the voiceover with, with the student, everything on the screens with the student. Do you also take the consideration like how long each of those videos are? Yes. So that's, that's taken into consideration. Those things are where it gets a little more complex for me. Right. Um, I think in part because I don't have that experience yet, but a lot of the time, and this is why I want to talk about the muddled results of screencasting and maybe why screencasting gets such a bad name in scholarship. So a lot of the time when you see the feedback that students give on screencasts, whether it's in a, in a paper that says uh, they did great, they improved learning, they increased memory, uh, or when you see that um, someone says scholars should look beyond the trends of screencasting uh, because we saw no increase in uh, you know com completion of tasks or something like that. Um, it's because nobody really has training in any of it, right? So I think that's kind of a cop out is to just say, oh, well, let's keep making the video shorter. So um, there's a great author who wrote on improving memory using uh, screencasts and video tutorials. I can't pronounce the last name. It's really hard to say, but it was published in 2016. And um, they say, don't concern yourself essentially with duration as much as purpose. I think it's a great thing to stick to. So for example, if I'm making an entire video on the degree audit, I probably can't do that in 60 seconds as much as your reference wants me to do it, right? Um, likewise, you see a lot of video lectures and classes that say the same thing. Um, here's a 60 minute uh, lecture on like chemistry or something like that. And I know we're getting out of the topic of advising, but purposeful uh, is more important than duration, right? especially for someone who's just beginning in screencasting with maybe not as much technical or formal experience um, than that. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I can definitely see advantages to that and the way in which you, you might use it in terms of um, particularly around information pieces. Whereas if it's going to be, um, you know, more of a, a conversational piece that that is still an, a necessary uh, requirement there. Um, I'm, I'm interested, I suppose, and, and it ties into a lot of what you're saying, but we, um, I think Matt mentioned in, in your bio, um, you have a, a student first philosophy. I suppose interested in, in uh, your thoughts on, on, on or what it, that means to you and, and I suppose how that ties into your work, Jaron. Sure. 
Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not going to make decisions that advantage my own workload. I think, um, I'm going to make decisions that advantage my students. I talk directly to them, figuring out what they need. Um, and I think, uh, that's why I've gotten such a positive response. I'll interact with my students. I let them take a part in actively producing material, um, that's going to benefit the campus. Uh, it is their campus and it gives them a lot of pride to take part in this. But, um, I think if we as educators take shortcuts, um, it sets a bad example. I think also if I display any sort of technophobia or unwillingness to self-regulate my own learning, I'm telling the students, go to your SI session, go get tutoring, go teach yourself this, um, you know, all of these things. And then I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm exhibiting just contradictory behaviors. And I don't think that's intellectually consistent. And to be a good educator, you need to um, walk the walk and kind of go for it. And I mean, I mean, I know you've all heard this before, but we're students forever, right? It's okay to learn something slow as long as you keep going and don't give up. So that's kind of how I see it. And my students teach me things all the time. So, and I know that made me just immediately sound like an old man or something like that, but they tell me things all the time about their preferences and how we can incorporate into their strategy. Um, and it's great, but it's, it's who we serve, right? We serve the students. Yeah. I like to see the reward, you know, and see the change, but change takes a while, you know? Yeah. Sometimes it takes a little longer than a while sometimes, but um, just like you're saying with learning from students, yeah. Whether it's us teaching a student, student teaching us, learning goes both ways in your position right now. Cause you know, you're doing a lot with the learning communities. And I think when we had talked before, you were talking about how this kind of position also kind of gives you that freedom and latitude to kind of like further develop and, you know, try to help these students as much as possible. Was that something like when you got hired that you got to really kind of create in th this position or was there already like structure to th this position? So there was structure to the position, but, um, there was no how to register for classes video at UCR before I arrived. So um, same with how to accept the LC block, um, same with how to create and submit a term plan. Um, so, and that's likely because, you know, the lack of kind of this, I'm, I'm going to inflate myself, but that's not the intention is technical expertise. It's literally a couple buttons and some editing, you know, um, is pervasive, you know, in higher education. Uh, and you see that a lot of places, a lot of people talk about that. But I think in response to the pandemic, what you're seeing is a lot of people who were like, oh, okay, now I got the hang of this. I can Zoom, I can screencast because I have to, right? So I do think that, but um, it just kind of formed into this. It was like, right when I was competent at my job, Jen gave me a lot of opportunity and freedom and didn't micromanage me, which is, uh, you know, I'll continue to say she was just a fantastic, you know, manager. And I started just noticing things and she was like, well, how would you problem solve this? Okay. You problem solved it. And then my director was like, how would you collect data on it? How would you establish the urgency? Right. Why do I care about this? That's not how she phrased it, but she, was like, you have to know the answers to those questions to make everyone else care. And then from there you can convince everybody else so uh, the methodology that I was talking about uh, earlier, these eight steps, at some point um, you talk about uh, changes in corporate culture, right? Which is the last step in this. So I have trained other departments on campus how to screencast, how to edit their websites, how to build learning management systems. And this isn't like part of my job description or anything like that, but I'm not in the business of job descriptions. I'm in the business of helping students and if I can create better resources on campus with my campus partners, that means we can create a better first year experience, college experience for all of our students. So if we can change the culture and I can be a part of that positive change, then that's what I'm excited to do. It's really interesting the way in which you've been able to, I suppose, use your background and interest in, in movies to in, in your work and incorporate it in to improve the, the student experience. We talked beforehand about, you know, your, your background and interest in music. Is that something that you've been able to bring in? Is it something maybe you would like to, or is that something that's completely separate and something you just enjoy for you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we talked about these, these mentors in the beginning, just like, oh, how did, and this is something I teach my 
my peers all the time is how to stay in touch with people, how to build and maintain relationships. This is what I do with my students as well. And it all originates from music. You know, um, when I, I talked earlier about how I worked for Amazon during those six months, I also worked for a great guy named Kevin Garcia, who's my brother's best friend. And he has shot music videos for everyone and anyone you could possibly think of. But um, he held me over for a little while. But Kevin's best networker I know. He's still talking to people from when he was like 12, you know? So it's the same thing, right? It's like, go work for people for free. Go try new things. You're not busy on a Saturday. I would rather be owed a favor or knowledge than money any day. That is kind of my theory. And so um, my director at University of Redlands, for example, email every now and again, ask how he's doing. We exchange scholarship. My thesis advisor at Chapman, I reach out to her. Um, my, there was one other student in my class at Chapman. We talk all the time. Um, everybody and anyone, you never know who they're going to be. So treat everyone with respect. And, um, I'm also huge on cold calling, which I think makes a lot of people uncomfortable, especially my incoming students. So, um, I'll call anybody and just ask a question. I'll ask for campus tours to get to know people, um, which a lot of people I think is highly unusual. When I was working in the film industry, we had this program called Studio System. And you could essentially look up anybody's number you wanted, like dream of a person, Spielberg, there's their office number. And you could only get this if like you were a registered production office, right? And it's the same thing. I used to look up people who I wanted to work for, call them, be like, hey, you want an intern? You know? And I do the same thing in higher education where I'm like, hey, what do you think about this? I re- hey, I really like your screencast. What, what did you use? Um, same thing with conferences. But it's like rigorous networking all the time that I learned from music, which transitioned me into film, which helped me be successful in higher education, which I now imbue into my peers. But um, yeah. So for example, I told you earlier, I recorded at um, Randy Jackson studio and um, that's not because I'm like this amazing musician, you know, and again, I'm not bad, but I mean, I'm, I, I messaged a guy on Instagram after messaging tons of producers, sent him all the, my recorded music. We recorded an EP at his house in Malibu. Uh, it, you know, got some looks and then he got hired at Star West, which is his, the studio I was talking about. Then I got over there, but that was all because of one message on Instagram, you know, and you hear stories like that all the time. It's, you have to reach out, cold call, do whatever you can. If you want to go help people, go help people. You want to go make a movie, go make a movie. So yeah, in this case, being very proactive. And yeah, if you want something, reach out. I mean, it's it reminds me of, um, so John Favreau messaged uh, Sasha Banks, WWE wrestler, and said, hey, I want you to be on The Mandalorian and sent her a message on IG through a DM. And she had said she hardly ever checks her DMs and just happened to just go on that one time. And there it is. It's like, and then she ends up being on The Mandalorian. So yeah, no, no, I think you're completely right. My my mentor, uh, he's a creative executive at Allie's, um, and I worked for him in a senior position uh, later coming back to Allie's, and he said these words that just like still haunt me to this day. He, he would always say, if you wanted it, you would have it. And that just haunts me, you know, because it's like, oh, maybe I didn't want it bad enough. Maybe I didn't do enough, you know, and that is to some degree very true. Um, if you wanted it, you would have it. Uh, maybe you didn't want it. Why didn't you want it? Uh, why didn't you try harder? All of those things are questions we should ask ourselves. And, um, in the game of students, it's like, if you want to help students, go help students, you know, don't talk about helping students. Don't talk about creating resources, go try it, work with other people who are more experienced than you. And then, um, while you're doing that mentor people, who are less experienced than you, you know, um, which is like a huge, huge thing we can do to positively affect change. Um, but I will say, unlike a lot of those days back then, I've never had a bad day at work. I enjoy my students, love what I do. Um, and particularly, I think that's in, you know, because of Jen and the learning community and all the peers I have. So we've had a great time. Yeah. And we've talked about, you know, mentors, you talked about, you know, people that, that we've connected with. And so our connection, not just being 
close campuses being Cal State San Bernardino and UCR, but our connection is through uh, Barbara Wallace. And so Kenny, I know she's retired now, but she did so much at, at UCR. I've met her at a previous Nakata conference. That was my first connection to her. Can you talk about Barbara and did you ever work with her or, you know, how, how she was at UCR? Sure. Yeah. Barbara Wallace is like legendary. That's the only way I know how to describe Barbara. So uh, Barbara, you know, she, uh, so I work at the undergraduate academic advising uh, center and her work there for, you know, I kind of want to say it was like 20 years or something like that, Matt. I, I don't know. She's going to, like I worked there for this amount of years, but she's just the most amazing, nice person ever. And she is just in part this, you know, she was the driving force of the learning community along with uh, Dean McKibben and Jen. And um, she used to work at the academic resource center, but she was just such a great mentor. You know, you had a problem. Barbara was not an alarmist. She was just the master of all things. Uh, she was great at banner. She was great at working with students. She was great at disarming uh, anybody who may have been frustrated. Um, she taught me so much. And in fact, she was the first person to kind of teach me about students first mentality. She taught me that phrase. Right. And she told me one day, I remember we were walking to a meeting. She was like, never, ever advantage your workload, you know, over the students. And that I had done that, but she was giving me, you know, just advice as a new, new employee when I had just been hired. Um, she told me all sorts of things. I mean, she's just incredible, you know, and it was a, a big loss to the uh, center when she left, but we got a great director who replaced her. And um, yeah, she just affected so much positive change, you know, to the campus, not just the center, but she was great. It was funny, you know, this is, totally true story. Barbara, uh, taught me how to, uh, work a circuit breaker because we were getting some, um, construction done. And I know this totally isn't relevant or interesting to anybody listening, but the three of us, but, um, you know, it was funny one day the power went out and she was like, I'm surprised you don't know how to work one of these. And I was like, no, Barbara, teach me. So you, you obviously have, uh, just a, a thirst for for knowledge that's very clear, and, and we we've covered a, a lot um, in the, the our our chat thus far. But I suppose is there anything um, at, that you're working on um, at, at the moment, or any ideas that that you that you have? Because you, you sound or, or like I, you sound also that you're juggling a lot. But I'm just I'm curious. I suppose is there uh, is there anything in, uh, further in, in the works? Yeah, I mean, there's a few things that I'm writing on and researching. Um, I'm really, I guess, interested in right now communication accommodation theory, which was like founded in the 70s. And it's all about um, convergence and divergence. I mean, to really simplify it. So essentially, when um, convergence is essentially when me and Matt, if we were talking, right, um, we mimic each other's behavior to make the communication more efficient, right? But if, for example, I got louder and louder or I, you know, accentuated my accent, it might cause the opposite, which is divergence. And then you can have mutual and non-mutual where one person's trying to converge or one person's diverging. Right. But what's really interesting is that communication and accommodation theory has not been applied uh, to screencast production theory or video feedback very much. And I'm interested in how you can kind of figure out verbal cues, nonverbal markers and figure out how they can work as an embedded production strategy into screencasts for academic advising. Um, so we know politeness cues, for example. If I say please and thank you to Matt, he's more likely to say please and thank you back, right? We know those things. So therefore, in our scripts, we might want to do that because we know they're going to reciprocate a particular response, right? So that's communication accommodation theory. I think likewise is more organization, organizational theory. You think inoculation theory is um, how like a brand, they will immunize you. And it's a pun, right? Not physically immunize you. They will inoculate you from changing your mind about them by associating with uh, certain political ideologies, right? So I'm sure you can think of a ton of brands who beyond being a specific company are affiliated with like a political idea, a political party or things like that. Right. So you're not just changing your mind about the brand. You're changing your mind about the political idea that they're attached to. And that's how they immunize you. So thinking of the learning community, 
I was thinking the other day, what ideas, what political ideas, what ideas, at least in higher education, beyond, I guess, uh, political ideas, are we attached to? How can we immunize people from changing their mind about the learning community, first year success, the ideas that we have? Um, and that doesn't mean we have to be politically affiliated. That's not what I'm, you know, uh, positing. What I'm saying is student success should not be any sort of like bipartisan issue, right? So what can we affiliate our se- uh, ourselves with uh, to do that? So those are some things I've been writing about, thinking about in terms of production strategy and then more organizationally. Um, I'm really interested about those things. Um, and I'm really interested in seeing how I get them wrong and fixing them. I think that's the best part is, uh, growing, you know, I have a great group of people who, um, who will read my work and, um, tell me when it's terrible and tell me when it's great. Um, someone had this great phrase, um, my director at Redlands, he talked about perceived failures. It's like win or learn essentially is what he talks about. It's like, you might feel terrible. And I, I use this phrase to my students that you did bad on a test but it's win or learn, right? You need to let go of these perceived failures you have so you can move forward because it's all about the growth that happens at the end of the day. And uh, as long as you're trying, you can't be disappointed. So that's what I've been writing on and researching. Yeah, and kind of thing goes back to what we're talking about earlier. I mean, we're, we're all students, you know, every day of our lives. And I think this will be some great topics to have you on again and, and talk about in the future. So if you'd be willing to come back on, we'd love to have you. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Now, if anyone listening has any questions or wants to reach out and connect with you, what's the best way for them to reach you? They can contact me at uh, Jaron, J-A-R-O-N dot Paschke, P-A-S-C-H-K-E at UCR dot E-D-U. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you both.